Welcome to today's webinar, The New Strategy Playbook, Seeing Around Corners with Rita McGrath, offered by Columbia Business School and Time for Learning's Business of Change program. Before I introduce Rita, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics for the webinar. As you'll see on your screen now, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag business of change. And finally, please submit those questions to the Q&A box. We'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Rita Gunther McGrath. She is the best-selling author, sought-after speaker, and a longtime faculty member at Columbia Business School. She is widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth during times of uncertainty. Rita has received the number one achievement award from strategy from prestigious Thinkers 50 and has consistently been named one of the world's top 10 management thinkers in its biannual ranking. Rita is the author of the best-selling book, The End of Competitive Advantage, and her most recent book is called Seeing Around Corners, How to Spot Inflection Points in Business Before They Happen. Rita received her PhD from the Wharton School and has degrees with honors from Barnard College and the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. She is also the faculty of the new Business Strategy, Achieving Growth Through Innovation On-Demand class currently offered through Time for Learning and Columbia Business School's Business of Change program. Rita, it's great to be with you today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Scott. Thanks so much for being the MC of this uh, event. And oh, uh, would, welcome, anything, welcome anything everybody. Welcome with you, absolutely. So <laughs> I will rejoin you in the last uh, 10 minutes for the Q&A. Great, okay, see you in a bit. Okay. Uh, well, hello everybody. So I thought I'd give you a little taste, a little preview of some of the material that's in my new timing, uh, Time for Learning course. And this portion of it really has to do with my new book, um, newish book, Seeing Around Corners, How to Spot Inflection Points in Business uh, Before They Happen. So a strategic inflection point uh, was first named by Andy Grove in the 1990s in a fabulous book called uh, Only the Paranoid Survive. And what he talked about was an inflection point as some change, typically in your external environment, that creates a 10x impact on your business. Now, if you get them right, right, your business can go to new heights. It represents an opportunity. If you miss them or don't respond or wait too long, it can cause your business to go into uh, decline. Now, the good news about strategic inflection points is that they often take quite a long time before they reach a critical mass. And of course, right now we're in the mother of all inflection points. We've got a pandemic, um, you know, an economic crisis, a social justice crisis, and under under all that, an, an environmental crisis. So you know, we've got all these forces kind of coming together. And the basic message is: once you pass through an inflection point, um, the past is not a good predictor of what the future is going to be. Now, even the pandemic was predicted when we had a whole pandemic preparedness um, set up that was dismantled in 2017 because people didn't take the warnings that this was possible uh, very seriously. Um, so what we're going to try to do here in this next uh, few minutes is get some understanding of what inflection points feel like, how they happen, and uh, what the consequences can be. Um, I would also say in the early days of, of an inflection point starting to bubble up, um, they often don't look particularly significant. So, you know, if I'd said to you, I don't know, 15 years ago, oh my God, YouTube is going to change the world of advertising and destabilize, uh, you know, markets and create the ability for someone who is really good at dressing up and promoting themselves to earn a living as an influencer, you would have looked at me and you would have said, YouTube, what is YouTube? YouTube is cat videos. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know? So today, of course, we realize the potential of what that's done. I mean, before YouTube, if you wanted to get a video message to millions of people, you would have to own a major media company. You'd have to own a movie studio. Uh, today, not so much. You, we've got all these technologies that make it so much um, easier. Now, a core idea that was central to strategy for many, many years was that the industry you were in was going to be the biggest predictor of your subsequent performance. In other words, in an attractive position, in an attractive industry, throw up entry barriers like crazy, and then you were going to be able to enjoy that advantage for a really long time. And I would say if that argument ever 
did hold, and maybe it did for a while, um, it certainly doesn't today. And that what instead we're dealing with is a concept that I call competing in arenas where an arena represents some kind of really important resource that you are contesting um, for with, with others. So just to take an example, um, Netflix has publicly declared that the arena they're competing in is the market for your disposable time. So as far as Netflix is concerned, you know, the enemy is not just other streaming providers. The enemy is, you know, a glass of wine with your girlfriend or a walk in the park or sleep. <laughs> you know, they want as much of that time as they can uh, get. And that really guides the decisions that the company makes about you know, what products to invest in, you know, how much money to pour into things like original content uh, and, and so forth. So let's take an example of how arena thinking would cast a different light on your strategic decision making. And I'm going to start with a concept that uh, Tony Ulwick, I think, invented it and Clay Christensen made it very popular, which is called the customer jobs to be done. And the intuition here is that customers don't actually want to buy products and services. They only buy them because there are jobs they want to get done in their lives. And so thinking about those jobs flips the way that you think about your customer from, oh, you know, I make Swiss bearings and titanium hardware and polyurethane wheels. That's what I produce. And in fact, that's what they're buying. But what they're wanting, the job to be done, is this feeling of soaring around on your, on your skateboard. That, that's the job. So we want to really start with the job to be done and work backward into what it is our company might need to do to appeal to those jobs. So I thought just as an example, I'll pick up on your friendly local teenager and clothing. Uh, what's the job that clothing does for teenagers? Well, it does the obvious things, right? It keeps them warm in the winter and not too hot in the summer and so forth. But when you think about teenagers in particular, clothing has an enormously important communicative job to do. What tribe am I part of? What tribe am I not part of? You know, what's my social life like? What impression do I want to give other people? It's a huge function of clothing for teenagers. Now, this is completely different than my mother's definition of what high quality clothing would be like. I mean, my mother, you know, it should, it should last through multiple wash cycles. It shouldn't wrinkle. It shouldn't have stains. Uh, it should be of you know, good value. It should last a long time. And it should probably be available from some store like JCPenney's. I mean, that was the image she had. Uh, very different view when we look at teenagers. Not teenagers being teenagers, what else are they doing? They're on their devices. Now beginning in about 2003, we had the very first phones, mobile phones, with cameras. So this is before the smartphones as we know them today, but we had these feature phones that had cameras in them. And teenagers being teenagers, what do they do? They're talking on the phone as they're shopping, they're taking pictures of themselves, they're, you know, sending pictures around of their social life. Think about it, right? So you're, you're doing something cool on Monday, and you're wearing a blue shirt, and then you try to send around a picture of you doing something cool on Thursday in the same shirt, and then the next week. And it's like, like how lame is that, right? What we want is uh, clothes that kind of last long enough to get the perfect selfie. Um, and then they should self-destruct, kind of like the old tapes on Mission Impossible. Um, and I don't agree with this, by the way. I don't, I'm not an ad advocate for this, but it did herald in. Uh, this was one of the factors that led to the popularization of so-called fast fashion. And the leading companies in this were companies like Zara, Inditex, H&M, uh, sorry, Inditex, which owns Zara and H&M and companies like that, where they emphasize, you know, they, they, they have rolling inventory, they don't have seasons, right? Um, they, they have, you know, the sort of urgency around it, buy it now, it might not be here tomorrow, and, 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 and. Um, and so what does that do when that's what teenagers want? They don't want traditional apparel and they don't want traditional four seasons worth of clothing where you sold as much as you could at a high price at the beginning of the season and then, you know, put the rest on sale at the end of the season. They want like a continuous flow. And if you want to see how that inflection point kind of played through this fast fashion inflection point, um, it certainly has been a contributing uh, element to the decline of department stores. And you can see again, this chart dating from about 2003, 
uh, you, you can see the sort of steady decline, steady erosion of department store sales. And again, it's not the only reason. There's a lot of other things. There's e-commerce and, and other things, but clearly the sort of four seasons worth of clothing where you'd go and shop at the beginning of the season with all this excitement and then wait, um, not, not so much. Who are the winners? You know, and any inflection point has winners and losers. The winners are uh, organizations like Roth Stores, right? Uh, they were one of the fastest growing companies in the U.S. for for many years, and they're you know straight up and to the right. Um, Roth Stores is kind of a treasure hunt, right? It's not a big department store. It's it's full of the unexpected. Uh, it's full of clothing which you can buy at a very inexpensive price, um, and that has gotten a following. Uh, there was just not too long ago a, a cover of the New York uh, magazine, New York Times Magazine, in which they basically declared sweatpants forever. So if you look like further at what's going on in apparel, uh, you know we're not buying suits. I mean, Brooke Brothers has filed for bankruptcy. We're not we're not buying clothing to go to the office anymore because so many of us are now working from home, and uh, so you know we're wearing comfortable clothes. We're not uh, you know we're not dressing up in uncomfortable clothes because you know, we're just at home, nobody's seeing us. And so a real sea change you can expect in the apparel business, which began with fast fashion. And I think now it's just that trend is just really accelerating as this inflection point comes through. Will we ever go back to wearing stuffy formal clothes in an office? Who knows? Uh, but certainly we're going to predict a much larger presence in our lives for, you know, casual informal clothing. Um, so I, I, I leave you with a couple of points. Um, the first is that when I first started in the field of strategy, uh, strategy was sort of about industry analysis and all the cool kids were looking outside the firm and what was going on with things like order of entry and innovation where we were studying what goes on inside firms and how do you grow through innovation as my Time Inc. course is, is all about. Um, was seen as like, you know, we're sort of huddled in the corner for warmth, right? Well, today, as competitive intensity has picked up, we're really seeing strategy and innovation merging, they're coming together. And increasingly, that implies we're going to have a much bigger investment in digital technologies. Um, and so I see the world of strategy really cohering around these three things, strategy, innovation, and uh, digital. So let me wrap up with some concluding thoughts, and then I'm going to invite Scott back and we'll take some questions. So start thinking about your questions and what you'd like to ask. Um, first idea is that the passage through of an inflection point is a bit like um, Ernest Hemingway's character. In The Sun Also Rises, one character asks another, well, how did you go bankrupt? And the response was gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and so too with an inflection point. They bubble along sometimes for years before they really start to get traction and have an impact on day-to-day -day life. I think it's super important to be conscious of what your arena really is. So what are you really competing for? Is it share of disposable time, share of disposable wallet? Uh, you know, is it share of, of you know, liquid? I mean, what, what is it that you're actually competing for? Uh, competition's probably not what you have conventionally thought it is. It can come from very unexpected new places. Uh, you want to be thinking always of what jobs are your customers wanting to get done. And I would also say you don't want to be focusing too much on prediction because it's just impossible. I mean, there's just too many variables to make prediction possible. But what you can focus on is preparedness, being ready uh, for whatever's going to come uh, when it comes. And I passionately believe that you really can systematically identify early warnings. So in the time course, uh, what we'll take you through is these frameworks, as well as a number of others, all related to this idea of how do you thrive in high uncertainty, highly unknown um, situations. So for a deeper dive, uh, you can certainly get in touch with me. I'm in all the usual social networks. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, I have an Instagram account now, and I've even got a YouTube channel. And uh, for those who are interested in these topics, I also do regular Friday fireside chats in which I invite interesting, positive, intriguing people uh, to spend an hour in conversation. And we do record those and they're on my YouTube channel if you have an interest in uh, catching up on some of what, what those are. And those are free. So feel free to join us and do check out the time course. Okay, Scott, come on back. Thank you, Rita. That was great. Great information here. A lot of good questions came in. So should we get to those? Absolutely. All right. First one came in from Peter, and I think this is a great kickoff question. 
It says, what are the best ways companies can react to disruption if they have an entrenched business model? Well, I think the first thing you need to be doing is experimenting a little bit at what I call the edges. Oh, we're good? I heard a word. Uh, experimenting, experimenting at the edges of your organization. And to do that, what you really need to be thinking about is where do I set aside some resources, not a huge amount of resources, but some resources to start experimenting with options. Um, and maybe a story would make this um, more, more, bring it to life more. So there's a, a company that I feature in the book called Klockner and uh, Co. And they are a metal services distributor. And the service chain, the supply chain in that business was just a mess. I mean, they were literally having faxed orders, you know, coming in from customers. Um, and the CEO of that company, a guy named Gisbert Rule, was very concerned about this because he saw all around him. He saw digital, he saw the rise of platforms, he saw people in, in, in you know, including digital processes in their things. And he said, you know, if somebody like an Amazon or another player comes into our market and digitizes our supply chain, we're toast. So why don't we do it ourselves? And so his first attempt was uh, he convened a bunch of think thinking groups in Duisburg, which is where their headquarters is. And that kind of didn't go anywhere. And so finally, in frustration, what he said was he took two engineers and he plopped them into Berlin, which is the Silicon Valley of Germany, basically. And he said, look, I don't care what you guys do. I want it to be something digital and I want it to be something that makes us easier to do business with as an, as an entity, as an organization. And so what they did was they said, well, let's tackle the facts problem. <laughs> you know, if we could make it so that you could order on your computer or on your phone, that would be much better. Now, what was fascinating to me about that was they put this in place, customers loved it, but as far as the organization was concerned, this electronic order sort of hit the boundary of the organization, but what happened behind it was exactly the same as what had happened before. So it didn't perturb the organization. It didn't create all these antibodies. And so once they'd proven the success of the electronic ordering, then they created an electronic parts tagging system. And that was great as far as the rest of the organization was concerned because it made it easier to find stuff, right? And, 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 and. So I think what you need to do is start have a clear, clear vision for how you, know, you want to deal with disruption, but start somewhere where you're not going to instantly create all kinds of political opposition to what you're trying to do. That's interesting. So I just want to remind everyone, please keep continuing to send those questions in because we've got some time here. Um, Rita, that's interesting because I, I don't know, I couldn't hear if you uh, mentioned it, but it almost is like selective uh, using the consumption chain. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. not not disrupting the whole consumption chain but doing it part by part by part do you say is the best way to do it starting at the beginning of that consumption chain or is it just finding the best place within the consumption chain to start yeah well let me let me explain that concept and then um, give some illustrations so um, in, uh, in one of the modules in the course uh, that, uh, that we're doing for, with time uh, is a whole module on understanding customers and who they are, what they do. And one of the really powerful ideas in that module is that customers are always moving through sets of experiences. And remember, they're trying to get their jobs done. And providers are often just unbelievably unaware of the experiences that they create for their customers. Um, and also, I'll give an example. Um, so I, I had a bunch of books that I was going to ship to some clients and I called FedEx and I had everything that was necessary to ship those books on a piece of paper. And I just stuck it on top of the box. Doorbell goes, I go hand it to the FedEx guy and he looks at this box in total horror. And he, he says, it doesn't have a label. And I said, oh, well, you know, go get me one from your truck and I'll happily fill it out for you if that's what you need. He said, well, I don't carry labels on my truck. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I cannot be the only person in the history of the planet who's tried to ship something via FedEx without a label on it. So, and I know it's not his fault. He's in a system he didn't design. So, uh, so I said to him, I said, um, well, well, how do I get a label then? He said, very helpfully, he said, we could overnight you one. <laughs> or he said, I think maybe you can get one on the internet, you know. And then he left, he left, he left me and my box standing there forlornly in my front door. Now, had I been in a real rush, which fortunately I wasn't, but had it really needed positively, absolutely to get somewhere overnight, I would have put the box in my car and gone off to UPS and FedEx would have lost that sale. More importantly, the, the, the brass, you know, at the, in headquarters in Atlanta, they, they have no idea of what just happened. Now, what just happened is really bad because I'm also a business school professor, so I talk about it a lot. That's an example of a broken consumption chain. 
And my argument would be anywhere you've got something like that, where the chain breaks down or the links aren't clear or the customer gets confused, the consumption can just stop. I mean, among the biggest competitors, many of you will ever face is the choice to do absolutely nothing at all, to non-consume, right? Um, so you really need to be thinking about that whole chain of experiences. And what I find happens with with any provider, ourselves included, is we don't see the whole chain, right? We focus on what we do, you know? We don't focus on how does this customer get their job done. Right, okay, great, thank you. So uh, Shreya just wrote us and she says, what according to you is key in finding the balance between prediction and preparedness? <laughs> well, um, I, I think prediction is really hard. Um, but what I do think you can do is you could say, what are some plausible future scenarios that I might want to be um, thinking about? And try to make them as different from each other as possible. So in the course, uh, one of the techniques I'll walk people through is you take two uncertainties, you create two different future levels of those uncertainties, and then speculate about what that situation would be like. So let's take something that might be really important to a consumer packaged goods company, for example. Um, there's a lot of evidence right now that we are in for a demographic bust, you know, a baby bust. That if we look at 2023, there's going to be 1 million fewer kids born uh, in those three years than, uh, than there would have been under more normal circumstances. And there's a number of reasons for that. But one is that those people with kids are just living right now with unbelievable stress, especially if they're little ones, and you've got two working parents. I mean, it's got people completely freaked out. And so a lot of people who haven't had kids yet are kind of looking at that going, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but even more, if I've got economic insecurity, if I'm not sure where my future is going to be, if I don't even know if those kids I bring into the world are going to be able to go to school, or I'm going to be able to get childcare, people just hold up. Now, if you're in consumer packaged goods, if you're in any sector where the number of consumers really matters, that's a big deal. So demographics is one of the more reliable things you can look at because, you know, that's much more predictable than many other factors. So another uncertainty might be, are we all going to go back to the office or not? So if we have a baby bust and we're all in the office, that has one set of implications. If we don't have a baby bust and we're all at home, that's a different scenario. So you want to be playing around with these different um, scenarios. Then what I recommend you do is establish a time zero event, which you can sort of think of as a headline from the future. So if I were in that scenario, this is how a columnist might describe it. Then you work backward and find out what the indicators are that would suggest whether you're coming closer to one or another scenario. Great, thank you very much. Peter just asked, how can management foster a culture of seeing around corners? Does it take a special type of leader? I think it takes a special type of leadership behaviors. Um, so you need to be open to hearing uncomfortable news. You know, one of the biggest reasons companies miss strategic inflection points is that their leaders were unwilling to listen. They didn't want to hear that, right? Uh, they didn't want to hear that the product's getting commoditized or that a competitor's cheaper offering is good enough or that a once very loyal customer is no longer buying as much, right? So you need a leadership that's open to hearing disconfirming news. Then you need a way of getting information from the edges of the organization into the corner office. And that's a whole module of our course, which is eight practices that allow you to do that. Um, and then you need to be able to interpret that information. So people need to be able to say, well, what does this actually mean? Come to some conclusions and then begin to let that inform your strategic decision making. So I don't think there's a personality type. I do think there's a set of behaviors that are very important. And a, a hugely valuable concept here is the construct of psychological safety which uh, Amy Edmondson from Harvard first right. developed back in the 90s. If you don't have a psychologically safe workplace, the research evidence is pretty strong. There's a lot of valuable information that won't be shared because people are afraid to speak up. Right. Do you talk about in the course, for those companies that don't have that, how that someone who may not be in a leadership position can help to create that within the organization? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, if you've got a toxic corporate culture and it starts at the top, that's hard to change, right? But you can create it in whatever part of the organization you have responsibility for, and you can influence others to behave in that very inclusive, open-minded way. Right, great. Okay, uh, a few more questions have been coming in, so let me get to those. Uh, well, you know, that would be, then can we talk a little bit further then, you know, Philip is asking, uh, how do you get 
what would you say are some maybe one or two or three good ideas for getting senior leadership aligned with this seeing inflection points with the vision? You know, if you're, if you're, you're saying from the edges, right? You know, you're, you're, and you want it. So the leader is open to it, but you still want to be that person who's approaching it as best they can. What are, what are some ideas you have on that? I think um, stories are incredibly compelling. So if you can get you know, a customer story, or if you can hear from somebody that's not part of your normal conversation, um, that, that can be very helpful. So a great example of this is uh, at Microsoft under Satya Nadella. Uh, they set aside, I think it's half an hour, every, every time the senior team gets together, and they have a whole staff that, that scours the world to look for where in the world is Mike, are Microsoft people working on something that's just super cool and innovative. And they get half an hour with the most senior decision makers at the company. And it could be anywhere. It could be Turkey or Greece or Israel or, you know, wherever they have offices. Um, and this team gets the chance to show their idea and pitch their idea and talk it through. And the senior leaders are now seeing what's happening maybe two, three, four, seven you know, layers, if you will, below them in the organization. So it creates a two-way dialogue. And I think that's what you want to foster. Um, a, a litmus test I use for senior leaders is um, what are they spending their time on? What are they spending their time on? Um, I was just, in fact, talking to Tom Peters and uh, of In Search of Excellence fame, and he talks about set aside time budget to talk to customers and make that a continuous dialogue. And if you get in the habit of doing that, it's much less likely that something's going to take you by surprise. Right. I also think it's probably a way of a company organization retaining talent. Mm -hmm know that what they're working on uh, is, is has value. So that's Absolutely. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gives them visibility, gives them that. Yeah. And keeps them there. So Moses, I think this is this is a really important question. So when you're talking about inflection points, do you can you give us some examples or situations that lead to inflection points that you've seen in your studies? Sure. So um, common sources are a change in technology, what's possible, right? A change in regulation. Uh, and regulations always lag, right? So regulations about things like data privacy are probably 15 years out of date relative to what technology can already uh, accomplish. Uh, another is change in social norms. So, you know, 50 years ago, it was perfectly normal for people to smoke like everywhere. And today it isn't, right? And that's because people said this is a health crisis and we have to put in place, um, you know, smoking's not illegal, but it's certainly been uh, constrained. Um, so social norms, technology, regulation, um, you know, sometimes people spark an inflection point. They do something that demonstrates something's possible and then there's sort of a surge uh, to, to follow them. So there's a number of different sources you can look at. What is interesting to me though is how long the lag is between the spark that starts an inflection point and it actually taking place. And uh, what caused me to write the book actually was um, an article a friend sent me, which was entitled, What If You Changed the World and Nobody Noticed? And this historian went back and looked at manned flight, you know, Wilbur and Orville Wright, uh, manned flight, and uh, looked at the date that this first historic flight happened, and then looked at the local newspapers. Uh, a week, a day later, no mention. A week later, no mention. It took three years before the implications of manned flight, you know, manned safe air travel uh, were understood. And the reason I think that's so interesting is if you think about it, the possibility of affordable commercial air transport completely decimated the uh, international trains system. It changed the way we do logistics. It changed our sense of what's possible. It changed immigration patterns. You know, it had this knock on effect in all these different parts of our economy. And it took years for people to realize what, what was going on. Yeah, that's great. All right, well, we have about one minute left, Rita. This goes so fast. Um, I always ask this question because I, I like a tangible takeaway. Like what, what can somebody do today to keep this momentum going from this webinar? Like what is something they can think about today personally? And then, you know, long-term vision, you've talked about a lot of long-term processes and, you know, incorporating and culture, but what is just something that someone who's watching today can do today? So William Gibson, who's a science fiction writer, very famously said, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Uh, 
And so something you could do today is ask yourself, where are bits of the future starting to emerge? So, you know, maybe there's a trade show, maybe there's um, a new technology you want to look at, maybe there's something you haven't really thought about um, that you could kind of look at and say, hey, if that were to become widespread, would that have a big impact on me and my business? So go to where the future is already starting to make itself felt. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Rita, it's always such a pleasure to work with you. And on behalf of Columbia Business School and Time for Learning uh, program, Business of Change, we thank you for attending today. We hope you're safe and well. Thank you, Rita. Thanks, Scott.